Thank you. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming and sparing your attention from the, the drama that is uh, unfolding in the United States right now. Um, for those of us who have been fixated on what's happening um, uh, in the United States, you might be relieved to know that I'm actually going to talk directly um, about it as well as indeed um, everybody else has this evening. But tonight I actually wanna talk a little bit about um, the history of the American dream, which is uh, what I part of what I was researching um, in this book. Now, it may sound ridiculous uh, to say that I'm going to talk about anything as sentimental and and trite and banal as the American dream in the face of Donald Trump's assaults on the American way of life, 250,000 dead Americans in a pandemic, inequality raging, Black Lives Matter protests, violence in the streets militias at election offices, and that's just yesterday, basically. Trump declared the American dream dead when he took office in 2016, a statement that shocked the world. And in many ways, he has proceeded to dance on its corpse for four long years. So can I be even talking seriously about the American dream, even as the American political process is so dramatically and visibly in crisis? But my answer is that this is precisely the moment to talk about the American dream, because it is time for the United States at last to understand our history. The reason I believe that the American political process is in crisis is because we have been in denial of our own history for too long. For four years, we have watched Donald Trump lie with almost every word he speaks, literally. I mean, they've been counted, right? There are people who count the tens of thousands of lies that he has told. And many, as, many of us uh, said, as, as we watched him lie, I said that reality would catch up with him eventually. You can only lie for so long because reality is stronger than the lie. To give a, an example um, that's you know, related to exactly what Naomi was just saying, the reality of a pandemic doesn't care, for example, whether you think it's like the flu or not. Its own reality is not subject to your belief system. You can believe whatever you like about that virus, but it's going to keep doing what it does. But the thing is, I've come to realize in the last couple of days, really sort of belatedly, I think, as we all kind of process what's happened, that it, it isn't Trump. Um, now look, all along, again, many of us have, have said that he was symptomatic of deeper systemic problems in American life. And again, um, John at the beginning said, uh, um, you know, lots of cogent things about exactly his, how symptomatic he is. And that is also clearly true. But I think we failed to see a really clear and, uh, and powerful way um, uh, or aspect of how symptomatic of America that Donald Trump is, was in our failure to see that his lying was the point. That's what he's symptomatic of, if anything, or as much as anything else. He is symptomatic of a nation that lies. His followers keep insisting that he tells the truth. And, and I found myself thinking that maybe he does, but maybe the truth that he's telling is that we're a nation of liars. Maybe the crisis that we're facing, the political crisis that we're facing is reality making itself felt at last, reality pushing past our collective lies. I profoundly believe that America has to tell the truth about its history. But instead of doing that, we take refuge in myths and illusions and fantasies and indeed lots of lies. The historiography of the United States is littered with lies, many of them deliberate. To give just one incredibly consequential example, there has been an entire history of the South since 1866 devoted to the lie that the American Civil War was not fought over slavery. That is a lie. It is easily disproven historically by the simple fact that the Southern leaders who went to war announced at the time in speeches that they were going to war over slavery. That lie has been immensely consequential because it saved face in the white South 
and because it saved the structures of white governance. It saved all of white America from confronting the truth of what had happened. And so when I speak of lies in American history, many people, I think, would say that the American dream itself is one of those lies. But when you look at the actual history of the phrase, when you look at historical truths around language, you discover it's not a lie. It's just that we don't know what it means anymore. Now, I assume that most people will imagine or assume that when I speak of the American dream, I mean the incredibly familiar meaning of that phrase as a dream of upward social mobility, of material success, of uh, rags to riches and bootstrapped self-improvement. But when you actually look into the history of the phrase, you discover that its meaning has dramatically changed. In fact, it has reversed over time. And that when it was coined, it was coined to talk about a different aspect of the American value system. The American dream as an expression began to emerge in American political culture a little over a century ago. The earliest versions of the phrase that I've been able to find come from 1899 and 1900. In 1899, a Brooklyn newspaper reported the story of a vast private estate being built in Vermont, which would make it the largest country place in America in 1899. This house, said the journalist, would once have seemed a wild and utterly un-American dream to anyone in Vermont because Vermont was a state of almost ideally democratic equality. Now, look, we don't have to accept this description of Vermont as an egalitarian utopia in 1899 to focus on what's interesting here. I think that today most people would assume that a giant house, the biggest private estate in America, would be the realization of the American dream. That is the American dream. But in 1899, it was an un-American dream because it was the opposite of ideal democratic equality. The American dream was not of a giant house, but of democratic equality. A year, a year later, another journalist used the phrase very similarly in a warning that the monopoly capitalists of the Gilded Age posed a grave threat to American democracy. Discontented, multi, sorry, discontented millionaires, it warned, pose the greatest risk to every republic. All pe previous republics have been overthrown by rich men, it said, and the United States was no different. It was at risk as well because monopoly capitalists were, and I quote, deriding the constitution unrebuked by the executive or by public opinion. If they continued to disregard the constitution without anyone pushing back, this article said, it would be the end of the American dream. The American dream was of equality of opportunity. The American dream was of justice for all. And so the mere existence of multimillionaires 100 years ago was seen as a threat to that dream of democratic, democratic equality. Monopoly capitalists, the article pointed out, would predictably form an aristocracy. And that meant that they would not merely be a symptom of inequality, but that they would create power structures that enabled them to embed and perpetuate that inequality. And that was a direct threat to democracy, a direct threat to the American dream of democracy. But what I wanna point out here, what I think is so important is that they were recognizing that democracy was a dream. They were not calling it a reality. They knew it wasn't a reality, but they were saying American democracy is what we are supposed to be uh, aspiring toward, toward the reality of an equality, a real equality of opportunity. About 20 years later, 15 years later, the um, writer Walter Lippmann became the first important writer to actually use the phrase, the American dream. And once again, he did not use it to mean what we use it to mean. I, I sound a little bit like, if anybody who knows the movie, The Princess Bride, I suddenly sounded like Inigo Montoya to myself. Um, but he didn't use it in exactly the way that those um, previous examples did either. He actually used the American dream slightly differently. And I wanna read a passage. I hope everybody will bear with me. Normally I would put up a slide so everybody um, could see it, but I think it's really important. And I think it really speaks to what is happening now. So this is what Lippmann said about what he thought the American dream was. He said, the past which men create for themselves 
is a place where thought is unnecessary and happiness inevitable. The American temperament leans generally to a kind of mystical anarchism in which the natural humanity in each man is adored as the savior of society. If you only let men alone, they'll be good, a typical American reformer said to me the other day. He believed, as most Americans do, in the unsophisticated man, in his basic kindliness and his instinctive practical sense. A critical outlook seemed to the reformer an inhuman one. He distrusted the appearance of the expert. He believed that whatever faults the common man might show were due to some kind of Machiavellian corruption. He had the American dream, which may be summed up in the statement that the undisciplined man is the salt of the earth. That phrase, mystical anarchism, I think of it all the time when I look at American political life right now. And as I've been watching this election, I think about that mystical anarchism that trusts, and it's the libertarianism that John was talking about as well, that trusts that without any government at all, man, man will sort themselves out and they will be good. And that, Lippmann said, is the American dream. For Lippmann, the American dream is a delusion, not because upward social mobility is a myth, but because undisciplined goodness is a myth. The American faith in the individual taken to its inevitable extreme creates the monstrosity of a self with no consciousness of other standards or perspectives, no willingness to admit the legitimacy of the other, of their right to exist, to disagree with you. It eliminates the possibility of a government based on the consent of the losing side because you do not accept the legitimacy of the other side. The American dream did not become popularized as a catchphrase until 1931 in a book by James Truslow Adams called The Epic of America, in which he tried to make sense of the crisis of the Great Depression, which in 1931 was both an economic crisis and a looming political crisis. Authoritarianism in Europe was on the rise and many Americans were concerned that similar despotic energies would support the fabled man on horseback who would become an American tyrant. Adam's book was a postmortem on the excesses of the 1920s, the way that a blind race for material success had corrupted America's ideals. America, Adams said, had lost sight of the American dream, which was, quote, not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of a social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain the fullest stature of which they are innately capable. The American dream, according to Adams, was about the power of character, not purchasing power. It was a return to the dream of democracy and equality. A desire for personal wealth wasn't the solution to the American crisis, according to Adams. It was the source of the crisis. America was losing sight of its soul, of the democratic ideals that defined it by focusing only on the economy. The American dream, by contrast, was of a collective vision of self-government. It was a vision of common weal, common well-being, well-being that is held in common and therefore mutually supported, a kind of enlightened self-interest. That was the American dream. Adams ended his book by noting that no ruling class has ever willingly abdicated. Democracy can never be saved and would not be worth saving unless it can save itself. But we can only save ourselves in my view if we tell the truth Democracy depends on a certain kind of truth telling because the social contract depends on mutual trust. The big lie is at the heart of the totalitarian project for a reason, because it's the anti-democratic poison in the well. The authoritarian project seeks to reverse the logic of democracy deriving from the consent of the governed and crucially from its dependence on the consent of the side that loses the contest. In every election, some are chosen, some are not, that's what an election is. The ones who are not chosen consent to abide by the decision of the majority. And that is so obviously what is under threat right now. The Trump led right wing is refusing to accept the legitimacy of the process and refusing to accept the legitimacy of the outcome. 
We knew he would do this because he told us when he said he would not commit to a peaceful transfer of power. If every vote is counted, it means that every person counts. I wanna finish with a final thought here that hopefully will pull um, these ideas together because we heard over and over throughout this election and indeed through the last four years, this is not who we are. This is not who we are. But how can you say in the midst of doing something that you are not the kind of person who does the thing that you are currently engaged in doing? F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote a note for his unfinished final novel, The Last Tycoon, that simply said, action is character. We are what we do, not who we say we are. The United States as a name increasingly sounds to me like a country protesting too much, trying to find a way toward what it likes to call a more perfect union, but is really fighting toward any kind of a union at all. It is revealing its divisions through the dishonesty of its name, but it is also naming what it is aspiring to. Joe Biden is right that this is a battle for the soul of a nation, but to win that battle, we have to tell the truth. We have to tell the truth about what happened in the past, and then maybe we can begin at last to make the real American dream a reality. Thank you.